Our scripture they're reading this morning is from uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God was pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's half, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. May God bless the reading of his word. Father in heaven, we have been talking about forgiveness, a precious gift that you gave us on the cross. And you called us to do just like Jesus, to forgive. Please come with your spirit and touch our hearts that we may not only understand, but practice and be transformed. We pray in Jesus' merits and thank you, Lord. Amen. We started this series on forgiveness and we talked about forgiveness. It's a command. It's not an option. We must forgive. It's a requirement. We are commanded to forgive. And then we talked about the process of forgiveness, how to forgive. And then we talked about Luke 17 and Matthew 18, and we show the parallel between the two, presenting the same story, just a few small differences. And we talked about the steps, how to get over the scars and the hurts. And then last time, last Sabbath, we talked about what forgiveness is not. And we underlined there that yes, while we should forgive, We should not enable sin. The one who hurts others needs to acknowledge and needs to ask forgiveness. In the Bible, there is condition for forgiveness. It says, if we confess. That's a covenant. It's a two-way deal. God cannot forgive without confession. It's like you want to go to the doctor and be well, but you don't go to the doctor. If you go to the doctor... You get the pills, and then you may feel better. You cannot stay home and expect that you just get well. If you need a surgery, you need the surgery. So we said, unless there is confession, the condition is is there. It's in 1 John. If, it's a conditional, if we confess, then God forgives and cleanses. Therefore, if we don't confess, if there is no acknowledgement, I am a sinner, please, Forgive me. If there is no acknowledgement, there is no forgiveness. So we said last time that the one who keeps hurting others has in humbleness to say, I'm sorry I hurt you. It takes enough spiritual maturity to acknowledge, yes, I did wrong, I'm sorry. But if you would confess, you must forgive. If he doesn't confess, you still must forgive. However, he says there, take another two or three. Because this is a serious matter. You just, not, you just don't ignore it and leave it alone, hoping it's going to get better. It will not get better. By ignoring, you enable. You allow. You are part of it. Therefore, take another two or three. If two or three would help you also, make sure that you are not way off, that you are balanced, that you have the proper view. You may have to learn some things. 
if he still doesn't acknowledge his sin, her sin. The Bible says, bring it to the church. Don't allow that one to hurt you and others. Church should be a safe place where nobody hurts nobody. If he still doesn't change, Jesus says, do not enable sin. He must be for you as is a pagan. And that's a tough one. How should be pagans for us? Should we love them? Oh yes, Jesus loved them. Jesus ate with them. Jesus healed them. Okay? Should we help them? Absolutely. Should we preach the gospel, the good news to them? Absolutely. But should we be like them or not? Basically, Jewish people put boundaries, put limits. We help you, but you can come so far. We don't do business together. When somebody doesn't repent, basically the message was put boundaries so you don't enable, you don't allow sin, you don't allow the one doing that to continue to keep hurting others. Put boundaries. We dropped it there last time. Today we continue a little and this is the second last message. Next Sabbath will be the last message on forgiveness. Today we continue a little. Why forgive? What is the final purpose? What is the final goal? The reason? How does it work? Where does it lead? A kid goes with his mom to Kroger. They go grocery shopping. And right there in the middle, there is a pile of cans. I don't know if it was green beans or something else. Just a pile of cans. And they were nicely arranged like a pyramid. And mom says, don't touch anything. When you say to the kids, don't touch anything, you know what that means for the kids? Ooh, something for me to do. Mom, don't touch it. When mom look in, looks in a different direction, the kid pulls a can from the bottom of the pyramid. You know what happened next? The whole pyramid of cans came down, noises spreading all over. What have you done? I'm sorry. You are not. You did it purposely. You'll do it again. You love it. I'm sorry. Mom, you told me that Jesus forgives. Didn't you? Yes. You told me that Jesus throws our sins at the bottom of the ocean. Didn't you? Yes. Should you forgive? Uh, well, yes. Mom, for some reason I have a feeling when we go home, you are going to go deep sea fishing. How does it work? Mom, shouldn't you just drop it? What is the final goal? Where does it lead? What happens? Why forgiveness? Why forgive? If somebody would talk to you and say, tell me why forgive, what would you answer? Well, you can say God commanded us to forgive. And you can give a bunch of Bible verses to prove it. Like, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another just as Christ forgave you. And there are many other Bible verses. We gave them at the first message. If you don't remember, you are getting older. You need to get the DVDs or go online and watch it. Okay. So you can say, because God commanded. That's an answer. It's a good one. But that tells you to forgive, not why. You can also say, well, because we need forgiveness and we are forgiven as we forgive. It's like in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive our sins as we forgive to the others who sin against us. Forgive as your heavenly Father will forgive you. Do not judge, so you will not be judged. Forgive, so you will be forgiven. And also, that's a reason. I forgive because I want to be forgiven. Is really that the reason? I mean, that's a good reason. But it's not the reason. Oh, you can say, forgive because it's good for you. It's good for your health, for your emotions, even for your physical health. You have no stress. Your heart goes well. You can sleep in the night. It does a lot of good to you. It's all about you. In fact, in our society, it's all about you. If it feels good, and if you like it, do it. Doesn't matter the others. Don't worry about the others. 
It's all about you. You see, <clears throat> according to the Mayo Clinic, forgiveness is good for our health. Studies show that anger creates a nasty effects on our bodies. It, it destroys the immune system, suppresses the thyroid function, slows down the body's metabolism, impairs the brain thinking, no sleep, anger is bad. Problem with joints, increases tension, diabetes, heart, headaches, joint pain, joint pain elevates heart rate, blood pressure, muscle tension. You feel kind of stiff in your neck, heart. But when you forgive, it releases anger, and you relax, and you breathe, and you are happy, and you know... A bad spirit leads to dry bones, the Bible says, but a happy spirit and peace and forgiveness leads to happiness. So it's good to forgive for your body, your vessels, your oxygen. And as you forgive, uh, you know, you can sleep and have peace. Is that the reason to forgive? Is that the goal? I forgive because I want to feel good. <clears throat> Carl Menninger said that if we, convince, if we could convince the patients in a psychiatric facility that their sins are forgiven, 75% of them could walk home next day. Louis Metz says to forgive someone is to set the prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. So is that the reason to forgive? You need to feel good. In our society, we, we, you know, it's all about you. Internet. I check the internet because the internet has all the answers in the world. That's where the wisdom is. And on the internet, most speakers and most articles that talk about forgiveness say, it's good for you, that's the reason you should do it. Is that the reason? Is that the final goal, the destination, the 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 main reason to forgive. Let me ask you something. Did Jesus forgive? Why did he forgive? He was on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them because if I don't forgive, I don't have peace. I cannot sleep and I, I'm troubled and I cannot die. So please forgive them so I can feel better. Did Jesus forgive so he could feel better emotionally? I don't even think. He thought about himself. It didn't cross his mind to think about self. He totally forgot self. He was thinking only about them. His reason to forgive was not that he would feel better. Okay, so why did Jesus forgive? Why did Jesus offer forgiveness? Do you have the answer? Why did Jesus offered, offer forgiveness? Why? To give us what? And you can say to save us. Is that a good answer? To save us. What is salvation? What does it mean to be saved? When you are saved, you get what? And you can say you get eternal life. What is eternal life? Is it that you can live forever and you are never sick and you have no more bills? Is that eternal life? So, folks, let's think a little. God created Adam and Eve without sin. And when they were created sinless, they had a perfect, listen carefully, relationship is the word, with God, a perfect relationship with each other. Would you agree with me? When sin came into picture, what happened to the relationship? Relationship broke. God comes and they do what? They hide. Sin makes separation, brings separation. There is no more joy. God is coming. Let's go and see him. Hey, God, how are you doing? They hide. Sin breaks relationships. Sin brings separation. What is next? They hide. And God says, Adam, where are you? I'm hiding. Why? I am afraid. Sin brings fear. Love casts away fear. 
Sin brings fear. What is next? What have you done? Uh, I ate from the tree. Why? She did it. She does it all. She talks a lot. She spends a lot. She does all the crazy stuff. She pushed me into it. A second ago, she was the nicest thing on two legs. He loved her so much, he would have died for her. Now, he says, let her die. She did it. Sin brings blame. God goes to Eve. What have you done? Not me. The snake. You created the snake. The snake pushed me. God goes to the snake. The snake didn't have a leg to stand on. Sin brings blame. Sin brings separation. Sin brings pain, anger, frustration, broken relationships. And God came with a plan. What was the plan? God came with a plan. Listen carefully. Why forgive? Jesus came with a plan. And he said, I'm going to die for them. I'm going to forgive them. Why? To bring back the relationship, to fix the broken relationship between God and man and between man and man. You follow me? Between God and us and between each other. To bring reconciliation. Listen carefully to the Bible verse that we read today. God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sin against them, forgiving them. And he has committed us the message of reconciliation. Man, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. And then he says, we implore, he's pleading, we implore you in Christ's name, be reconciled. In a short paragraph, you have the word reconciliation five times. Did you notice? Reconcile, reconcile, reconcile with God, reconcile with each other, ministry of reconciliation. God reconciled. He wants us to reconcile. We are ambassadors to reconcile. Reconcile, please. Why forgiveness? To fix the broken relationship and bring reconciliation. Bring back God with humans and bring back humans with humans. Reconciliation. What is the final goal, the reason, the purpose for forgiveness? Reconciliation with God and each other. Listen what it says here. Through him, to reconcile to himself all things on earth or in heaven, by making peace through his blood on the cross. Basically, through the cross, he offered forgiveness to bring reconciliation, to fix the broken relationship. Reconciliation, reconciliation. Well, let's go a little into it. In Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mountain, you remember? In Matthew 5, scholars talk about six antitheses. Contrasts, six, antithesis or antithesis. I don't know how to say it. Doesn't matter. Those are like this. You have heard that it was said, but I say to you, you remember? Six times. You have heard that it was said to you, don't cheat on your spouse, don't commit adultery. But I say to you, if you even look to a woman lustfully, you have committed adultery. Or, you have heard that it was said to you, do not commit murder, do not kill. But I say to you, if you hate your brother, if you are angry with your brother, if you criticize your brother, if you call him raka, that means you are stupid. If you call him names, if you hate him, if you criticize him, if you have anger with him, if you have frustration with him, you already killed him. I say to you, you will pay the judgment. Do you remember those things? You have heard that it was said, uh, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, pray for those who hate you and those who persecute you and bless them. You remember? What is Jesus saying? Jesus says, it's not enough to work at the exterior level, at the action level. You need to work at the heart level. It's a matter of the heart. 
It's a matter of the heart. You need to change the heart. You need a new heart. It's not enough to change the external behavior. You need to address the heart. You need to make sure that there is healing and there is change inside. It's a matter of the heart. So among these six antitheses, you have heard, but I tell you, Jesus gives the first one that we will talk about today that is related to forgiveness. And he tells us, why forgive? Listen carefully. You have heard that it was said, you should not murder. And you'll pay the judgment. In, in Greek it says you'll actually be judged and pay for it. But I tell you, if you are angry or frustrated with your brother, you'll pay as you kill them. Therefore, and this is where it comes. Listen carefully. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar in the church, and remember that you have a problem with your sister or she has a problem with you, leave your gift right there in front of the altar and first go and be reconciled. Then come and offer your gift. This is what Jesus says. If you go to church and you don't have reconciliation with somebody, drop it. Leave it. Before benediction, forget worship. Go and fix the problem. If you pray and that problem is not fixed, if you give gifts and you serve in the church and that problem is not fixed, if you read the Bible and that problem is not fixed, if you go to church and worship and that problem is not fixed, God will not listen to your prayers. God will not accept your gift. God will not accept your worship. It doesn't do any good to you. You deceive yourself. You will pay the judgment. That's no religion. That's exterior forms. In Isaiah chapter 1, God says, I hate your gatherings when you gather to worship. I hate your prayers and I turn my face. You need first to address the poor and to address the conflicts. You need first to bring reconciliation and then come and worship. Folks, do you, do you hear it? All religious things that we do, don't make any difference. Our prayers don't get an answer. Our worship is not accepted. Our gifts are not received. Our service is not received. Unless we first address reconciliation. All those make zero difference. Unless there is an attempt to bring peace. Listen. Be reconciled. Be reconciled. Before benediction, before prayer, before studying the word, before singing the song, right there in the middle of your worship, leave the church, go find that brother or sister, address the problem, set things right, then come to the church and your prayer will be listened. Go find the person, be reconciled, then come and offer your gift. Reconciled, reconciled. God has reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. God is reconciling the world to himself. And he committed us the message. He's repeating again and again and again and again. So, <clears throat> Paul talks about the same thing, but in a different way. Before I get there, I want to, to, to give you a story. Uh, let's, let's, let's read the Bible verse first. God, yeah. Um, I want to give you a story first. I'm sorry. There was a family. I read the story on the internet. I don't remember it very well. There is a family that they got divorced. There was a lot of pain, a lot of hurting, a lot of name calling, a lot of insulting a lot of uh, fight in the court, lawyers, expenses. And they had a child that was about four years old. And they could not have children. And they have been going to doctors and taking pills and waiting to have children for many years. Eventually, they had a child. And the child got leukemia. And as the child got leukemia, they started to blame each other. It's your fault. He didn't eat healthy. It's your fault. He spends time on the TV with you instead of going to sleep early. It's your fault. You are too much instead of being home with your kids. It's your fault. It's the blame. You remember? It's everybody's fault but not mine. In fact, I believe I'm the single one that I do no mistakes. So, 
as the blame started to escalate, they got into separation, and then they started to talk to others, the modern family. You talk to somebody at work instead of talking to your spouse. And as they were talking to others, getting emotionally close to others, they got too close to others, if you know what I mean, and they started to cheat on each other, and then they learned about that, and they got into arguments and fights and wars, and eventually divorce. A lot of hurt, a lot of pain, and they put all the energy into bitterness and hate and war. Who gets the child? Who gets the house? Who gets the car? After a painful divorce, the child was cut in half and separated in half. A week with you, a week with you. And eventually, the child died. I'm going to jump quick over the story, get to the end of the story. It was like two pages on the internet when I read it. At the funeral, before the child died, the pastor visited. And the pastor said, what do you want me to pray for? And the child says, what happens to me when I die? And the pastor said, nothing, you go to rest. When Jesus comes, there will be a resurrection, and then you'll go to heaven. Well, I do believe that because I love Jesus, but what happens to mom and to dad? And the pastor said, well, I don't know. Well, don't you need forgiveness to be in heaven? Yes. What if they don't accept forgiveness and don't forgive each other? Can they be in heaven? No. Well, I want mom and dad to be in heaven. I don't want to be alone. So pray that mom and dad would forgive each other. And the bottom line of the story is that the kids said, if they don't like each other, how could we live close next door so I could visit both? If they hate each other, they have to live far away. They cannot even be in heaven. So at the funeral, the pastor told the story that the child said, pray that mom and dad would forgive each other. And the story says that at the funeral, they put their heads down, tears started to come, and they turned to each other, and there were all the I'm sorry's and forgive me's, and you are forgiven, all those nice words. And they said, we have a new family. I have a family, you have a family. We cannot live together anymore. But we should stop hating each other. In fact, we should help each other. We should reconcile. So please forgive me. It's my fault. And he said, no, it is my fault. Okay, I forgive you. I forgive you. It took the death of the child for them to reconcile. Folks, it took Jesus' death for us to be reconciled to God and to each other. It took Jesus' death. And the reason was not that we feel better, not that we can be in heaven and live forever and have no bills. The reason was to bring back the relationship that was broken between God and people, between people and people, and between God and God, because sin broke the relationship. On the cross, Jesus said, Father, why have you forsaken me? The sin was so much that even God turned his face from Jesus. Sin breaks relationships. The cross brought reconciliation. So, let me read a quotation for you. Kenneth Schaefer in Christianity Today says, forgiveness isn't pretending nothing happened. Or what happened doesn't hurt. It's even for, it's not forgetting or going back and start all over again. Forgiveness is refusing to allow anything to destroy the relationship. There is a place to say, I'm sorry. A place to tell the other one, all is forgiven. But the goal, the reason, the final end is to reconcile the broken relationship. You see, <clears throat> that's the reason Jesus came. It's not that you go back to the same relationship. In Matthew 18, we talked about it last time. You do your best. You go and you try to bring reconciliation. But the other one has a choice. They can say, I'm sorry, or they say, I don't care. And if you do all you can to bring reconciliation and they refuse, you still forgive them. But that doesn't mean that you go back to the same relationship. For instance, wife that has been beaten, abused, can say, I forgive you, 
but we are going to live separated. We don't live together because I am not willing to continue to take the abuse. In fact, if you try to do it again, I'm going to call the police for your benefit and for mine. You don't enable sin. You forgive. I called Amazon and I said, I need a suitcase. Mine is broken. I ordered the suitcase. I was specific, the item number, so and so, this is the picture, this is the price. They sent me two chairs. I mean that. I called them, I said, what's wrong with you? I asked for a suitcase. They look, oops, sorry, we did a mistake. I said, you are forgiven, now you have to fix it. I'm not going to get angry. I don't hate you. You are forgiven, but you have to fix it or pay for it. Forgiveness doesn't mean necessarily that you hate and you criticize and you are bitter. You forgive, but they have to be accountable and fix it and not repeat it again. You follow me? Talking about that is not that if you had a business partner that has been dis dishonest, stealing, lying, abusing you, that you have to keep, because you forgave him, you need to keep doing business with him. No. Hey, I forgive you, but you do your business, I do my business. <clears throat> you should not probably go back to the same kind of relationship, but you should forgive. You should forgive. Let's talk a little about Matthew 18. We talked about that. Put boundaries. Make sure that you don't enable sin. Make sure that it doesn't happen again. If it happens again, you enable sin. You are part of that sin. Keep some safe distance. Jesus doesn't put band-aids on open wounds and say, oh, forget it. Let's sing Kumbaya, hold hands together and pretend it didn't happen. Jesus is not into Kumbaya. He sinned. He needs to ask forgiveness. He needs to repent. He needs to change it. He needs to be accountable. If he doesn't, you need to put limits so he cannot hurt you again or others. Sin has to be addressed. Nevertheless, nevertheless, it's very clear. Live in harmony with each other. Do not repay evil for evil. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live in peace with everybody. Do not take revenge. Let God do that. Feed your enemy. Pray for your enemy. If he's thirsty, give him water. Doing that, you put red coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, watch what Paul says about forgiveness. Very clear. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live in peace with everyone. What does he say? What does he say? He says, if it's possible... Paul knows. He doesn't say, live in peace with everyone, period. He says, if it's possible. He knows that in this world, on this earth, it's not always possible. But you got to do your best. You got to try. You got to talk to him. You got to confront him. You got to forgive him. You got to make him accountable. You got to go there and do your best. If not, set limits. Nevertheless, forgive. If it's possible, do all you can. But then he says, as far as it depends on you. What does it mean? If there is something that would hinder, that would stop that relationship, make sure that it's not you. Make sure that on your side, you took all the steps. If there is still conflict, that's not because of you. You went, you talked to them, you said, you know, I forgive you. This is what you did to me. It hurt, but I forgive you. As far as it depends on you, make sure that is not you that breaks the relationship. Make sure, even if you have to put boundaries, make sure that as far as it depends on you, you do everything. <clears throat> there are cases when full recovery and full relationship can be fixed. But there are cases, as long as we are here, that you cannot go back to the previous terms. It must be boundaries. But still, you need reconciliation. As far as it depends on you. You remember I told you a story when we started five messages ago about a lady 70 years old in South Africa. You remember the story? 
a lady, 70 years old, she's in the courtroom. A few police officers came to her house, took her son, shot him in the knees, and then poured gas on him and burned him alive. And then they came back to her house, took her husband to a place, shot him in the stomach, beat him while he was bleeding to death, took her there, poured gasoline on him, and have her, had her watch while he was burning alive. And the last words when he was burning were, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they do. Now the lady is in the court and those police officers are there to pay for their crimes. When the court says to her, Mr. Van der Broek, Van der Broek, he is the one who led the executions. What do you want him to do? What do you want us to do? The lady said, you remember the story? I want three things. Number one, I don't have any family left over. He killed my family. And I still have a lot of love. I want him to become my son. I want him to come once a week for the rest of his life to my house. I want to feed him and tell him about Jesus. I want him to have a chance to be saved. Number two, I want to go to the place where they burned my husband and my son so I could take those ashes and give them a proper burial. Number three, I want two people to help me walk to his place there in the court. And they thought, she has a gun. Let's check her. She had no gun. So they helped her walk there. And she gives him a hug. And she says, I want you to know, Jesus forgives you, and I forgive you. But you do need to acknowledge your sin. And you do need to ask forgiveness. Because on the cross, he offered you free forgiveness. But you'll never cash it. Unless you acknowledge and confess and believe that you are forgiven. You'll never receive benefit from that forgiveness unless you acknowledge it. You need to acknowledge, you need to confess, and you need to believe that you are forgiven. Then you are forgiven. Jesus forgave you, and I forgive you. When she said that, Mr. Van den Broek started to cry, and he collapsed. And there are many people in the audience that have been hurt and persecuted, and they softly started to sing, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. We sang the song, didn't we? To save a wretch like me. I once was lost, and now I'm found. You remember the song? Everybody knows the song. Amazing grace. And while you're singing, the lady says, because Jesus forgave so much and saves me, I forgive you too. Those who are forgiven are those who forgive. And those who don't forgive are those who have not experienced forgiveness themselves. Reconciliation is what God does for us so we can be back together with him and we can be back together with each other without hurting each other. That's the reason he gave us forgiveness. He didn't give us forgiveness only for us, but he gave us reconciliation for the entire universe to bring back the broken universe because sin brought pain in the whole universe. It says, he himself is our peace who has made the two groups back one. Remember, Isaiah says, in 59, Isaiah 59, the sin brought a wall of separation. And Ephesians chapter 2 says that Christ took that wall down and put back unity, reconciliation. He himself put the two groups back, breaking the wall, destroying the barrier, the dividing wall. Isaiah 59 says that sin brought a wall of hostility. Christ on the cross destroyed the wall. His purpose was to create in himself a one new humanity out of the two, making peace in one body to reconcile both to God. Not only here on earth, but through him to reconcile all things on earth and in heaven, 
making peace through his cross. Folks, there is a day, soon, sooner than we think, there is a day coming when Christ will come back to actually put back together God and people, people and people. And that will be the end, the goal of forgiveness, the full goal, the full reconciliation, a day when Christ comes back and we'll be back together with Christ and with each other. It says there, after this I looked and there before me there was a great multitude from every nation, every tribe, every language standing before the throne of the Lamb. There is a paragraph that I love in the great controversy, page 678. Sin and sinners are no more. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the whole creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness. From the smallest atom to the greatest world, all things are perfect in joy and they declare God is love. There is a time that he will bring all things back together. That's the goal of forgiveness. That's the reason you should accept forgiveness by faith, forgive others by faith, and if they don't confess, still forgive them and do all you can as far as it depends on you. You don't have to go back to the same relationship, but you have to stop the hate and the bitterness. You have to love them and pray for them. Jesus died on the cross to bring that type of forgiveness and reconciliation. And that's the final goal. That we have peace with each other and peace with God. So, I'm asking you now, we have been learning about forgiveness for five Sabbaths. We have one more and we finish. If you heard something in all these messages, don't you think that God is calling us to forgiveness? God is calling us to fully accept forgiveness. Not because we deserve it, not because we have to do something for it, but because he paid on the cross. Don't you think that God is calling us to fully accept absolute, total forgiveness in faith? We cannot understand, we cannot deserve, we cannot feel in faith based on his blood to fully accept it and rejoice in it. Don't you think that God is calling us to the same, forgive others, fully forgive, not because they deserve it, but because God forgave you? And also bring reconciliation and joy and peace and unity back together. Because Jesus says, when they are one, then they are my people. Satan brings separation. Jesus brings unity. Don't you think that God is calling us back to unity and peace? If you sense that God is calling you to do that, would you turn left and right and say, I am forgiven and I am going to forgive everybody. Do that. You don't do that. Turn left and right. Tell them that you are forgiven. You don't believe in it. You should scream, I am forgiven. I want to hear you. Folks, we are forgiven. And we need faith to enjoy it. And we are to forgive. And we need faith to do it. I'm forgiven. And I forgive. Fully forgiven, fully forgiving. If you think that God is calling you to that, there is a time when you will harvest the results of your decisions today. Don't wait for that time. Start doing it today. Start being forgiven and start forgiving. And don't look for your peace, for your comfort, for your benefit, forget you. Society looks for me, 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 me. God forgets self. And he sacrifices himself for the others. If you think that God called you to full forgiveness, start accepting forgiveness daily. Start forgiving daily. Start looking for the one that has been hurting you or you have been hurting and go and say, I'm sorry. And go and say, I forgive you. 
and do all you can to bring reconciliation. Because if you do it today and you do it tomorrow, you don't go to judgment. But if you don't do it, you will pay at the judgment. Because this way is the single way you can have peace with God and you can be in heaven and have peace with each other. This is the single way Christ can live in your hearts. There is no Christianity if there is no reconciliation. There is no Christianity based on forms. I go to church and I read the Bible and I pray and I keep Sabbath and I serve and do Sabbath school and teach and sing in the choir. There is no salvation in, in those things are good things. But unless there is reconciliation with God, and reconciliation with each other, the other stuff doesn't make any difference. That's Christianity 101. God is calling the Christians today to really live what they preach. It's not enough to do what the world does. Talk about Christ, talk about love, a bunch of words, but not leave it. It is time to actually humble thyself in the sight of the Lord and forgive and thus forgiveness. If you have a conflict in the family, it's time to, to solve it. If you have a conflict with somebody, go to them. If you did and they didn't change, that's their business. You do all you can on your side. As far as it depends on you. As far as possible. You should do all you can to bring reconciliation. If you think that you want to make that decision today, starting today, I'm inviting you to stand up and let's pray together. We are going to acknowledge in prayer that we heard Christ and we heard Christ daily and he died on the cross to forgive us and as he forgave us, we ought to forgive the others and bring reconciliation with God and each other. Let's pray together. We will keep quiet while the organ is playing for one minute. And each one is going to pray in his mind, seeking reconciliation. And then I will have the closing prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for Jesus and his cross. Thank you for bringing reconciliation and trying to reconcile the whole world back to you and to each other. Father, you made us ambassadors and gave us a ministry of reconciliation. We make a decision today to accept forgiveness and to forgive. Please help us to show love and unity and peace and do all we can to bring reconciliation not only in our families in our churches but to the whole world to bring Christ and his cross so there will be hope and salvation so there will be we'll be spending eternity again with you and each other as sin broke that relationship through Christ that relationship is fixed again Help us be part of it. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Thank you, Lord. Amen.